We might be done with Dracula, but I'm not quite done with vampires yet. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about Prince Lestat, which is the first in the final trilogy of books in Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles series. And for many, this was seen as a return to form after the much-hated Blood Canticle. Unfortunately, I'm going to say this right off the bat, this wasn't really a book that I enjoyed very much, and while I can appreciate that it was certainly an improvement on Blood Canticle, not that that was a very difficult thing to do, I still think it has some pretty significant flaws. Part 1. Summary Set in 2014, ten years after the events of Blood Canticle, Prince Lestat finds the vampire community in chaos. All over the world, fledgling and even ancient vampires are being slaughtered by their brethren. Behind the murders is a mysterious voice, compelling the vampires to kill one another. Is it the Queen of the Damned, Akasha, back from the dead? Or is it something more ancient than even the Queen of Vampires herself? Lestat de Lancourt, the Brat Prince, is called upon to unite the vampires and defeat the voice. Part 2. A Great Premise so let's start with the things that I enjoyed about this book, which unfortunately isn't all that much. But what I did like is the effort that Rice has made not to fall into the traps of some of her earlier novels. If any of you have read the middle books in the Vampire Chronicles series, you will know that oftentimes there's either a story being told from the perspective of a different vampire, going back to the past, and then we sometimes get a bit of repetition of the same story, and so that is not very interesting to read sometimes, especially when it's the third or fourth time. Or we have a story like in the Mayfair Witches crossover novels where we do have an interesting premise for a story but then the interesting premise is paused because we need to get a lot of backstory so we just go back into the past for ages and then at the very end everything sort of comes together uh, in sometimes in a haphazard way. Now it does seem that Rice is trying not to fall into that trap with this book but unfortunately she does fall into some other ones. <laughs> but before I get to that, what I will say is the premise itself is quite an interesting one. Having this voice haunting the vampires and then sort of the mystery around what this voice is. I do think it's a little bit obvious what the voice is, but it's still an interesting premise and promises quite a lot. I don't think it's necessarily resolved in the most interesting way, but it's a good way to start a book. That being said, again, although we do have an interesting premise for a story, that isn't enough to make a great story. And unfortunately this book, in my view, is mired by poor characterization and not very good plotting either. Part three, an heir to the Queen of the Damned. So Prince Lestat is meant to be a direct sequel, more or less, to The Queen of the Damned, which is the third book in the trilogy. And although it does reflect on some of the stuff that has happened in the other books, really the plot and the things that it's focusing on are very much related to that story, to Queen Akasha, to the mythology, and everything that goes on in those first three books. And I think to some extent that was a wise decision on Rice's part, because a lot of those middle books are much derided by fans, especially the crossover novels like Blood Canticle. And so just getting away from a lot of that, I think, was probably a good move, to the point where some of the characters from those crossover novels don't even appear. Rice even flirts with the idea that Akasha didn't even die in that book at one point. It's kind of meant to be one of the misdirects in the book that take you away from what's really going on. I did also find it quite amusing that at one point she even mentions within the context of the story that the Queen's death scene was kind of <laughs> too easy almost. You know, she's killed quite easily as Queen Akasha, and fans have pointed this out as a you know, a niggle with that story, so it was funny to see Rice sort of note that here in a sort of a meta way. One of the things that makes The Queen of the Damned stand out as a book in that first trilogy is that it's told from a third-person perspective, and it introduces lots of side characters who are all reacting to the awakening of Akasha, and so the story really deals with all of their reactions building up to the climax when all the vampires come together to defeat the Queen. And this book has a very similar structure. Again, we have Lestat as the kind of bedrock of the story, but we also have lots of chapters that deal with other vampires and their reactions to what is going on. They all come together in the end, and the badness is kind of defeated. So not, so not only is this a sequel to the novel in terms of its plot and its main essence, it's also kind of a sequel in the way that it's told as well. Unfortunately, I don't think Prince Lestat comes anywhere close to the level of success that the Queen of the Dam did. Firstly, this novel makes very little use of its well-established characters. We have the promise of Louis returning, Armand, Marius, Pandora, and even Gabrielle, who has been gone for absolutely ages, all making returns in this novel, and yet it really doesn't feel like any of their returns was remotely necessary. 
For me, this was most disappointing in the case of Gabrielle, because I think that it is the relationship between Gabrielle and the start that makes The Vampire of the Start such an interesting book. This ambivalent relationship between a mother and the son who made her into a vampire, and then her just disappearing for years. We don't really get any resolution or development on this. Gabrielle comes back, they have a scene together, and then quickly Gabrielle is relegated to a background character, to the point where she pretty much does nothing really interesting for the rest of the story. This is also true of Louis, who does get at least a chapter to himself towards the end of the story, and I feel like Rice was sort of going for some nostalgia here, sort of bringing it back to the original vampire, but the problem is, while it's sort of nice maybe for fans to have that chapter, it doesn't really fit with the story because, like Gabrielle, Louis doesn't really play a role in the story at all. So it's just not earned, it's just not an interesting chapter to have when we look at the book itself. The reason why I think the well-established characters didn't get much of a look in is because Rice decides to introduce lots of new characters in this book. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, you want to keep your story fresh. But you know, if you're going to introduce a lot of new characters, you better make sure that they're interesting, especially when readers are going to be comparing them to the well-established characters, who are also in this story, just massively underused. And unfortunately, Rice really just seems to have dropped the ball with characterization, because I found that all of these vampire characters were just completely interchangeable. I can barely remember any of them, aside from one was a doctor, and you know one of them was his kind of servant or whatever, one of them was a guardsman for Queen Akasha. You know, you can sort of remember their roles, but in terms of their personalities, it's all just generic, you know, highly romantic vampires being highly romantic vampires. <laughs> Nothing else really going on at all. And that was a real shame, because I actually found that with The Queen of the Damned, Again, when Rice did introduce those new characters, I thought that they were really well done and their stories were interesting, but that just wasn't the case for most of these new characters. The one exception I will say is this character of Rose, who is Lestat's ward, who he saved at one point and has sort of been in her life as a, as a figure, and there's like a tangent that we go on into Rose's life that is actually quite interesting, and I think her character is quite interesting. Uh, and then she gets into a romance with Lestat's son, which is a weird revelation, because the scientist vampire did something and made Lestat have a biological child. <laughs> and they have this romance uh, that reminds me a lot of Mona Mayfair and Quinn Blackwood and their romance, and it is equally boring and annoying as that romance. And it just saps any energy or interest out of these two characters as well. So ultimately, we did have something interesting there, but I just feel like it was very much a wasted opportunity, because it didn't really add much to the story, the, you know, the central plot. It was just kind of there as an idea, and I don't really know what Rice was going for. Maybe it's something to do with the future books in the series, perhaps, but, you know, even if you're going to have something planned for future books, it needs to play a role in the particular story that you're telling, otherwise it's just like, well, why is this here? Why not just save this for the next story? Just didn't really come across as motivated, and the characters really weren't all that engaging or stand out. And so really, it's just kind of annoying because there are these vampires with a lot of history with Lestat as a character that have really good characterization in the novels that they were in, and they're just completely underused here, and what we get as a replacement are just very banal vampire characters that don't stand out from each other. Part 4. Poor Pacing. So to be fair to Rice, as I said, she doesn't fall into her usual pacing problems with this book. We don't have a lot of backstory, just bogging down everything down, but unfortunately there are still pacing issues, and the pacing issues come from the fact that the story has all of these characters, and so many different chapters and parts of the story are from the perspectives of these characters. And so what you often find with the story is you're getting into it, there's stuff happening, things are moving, and then we have to pause because we need to go to another character, and then another character, and then another character, <laughs> and so all of that tension just sort of dips away, and by the time you return to the original character that you were interested in, you've actually forgotten what it was that was, you know, made them interesting in the first place. <laughs> so yes, it doesn't have the same pitfalls of some of Rice's other books, but I think that this overuse of new characters and having lots and lots of POV chapters from different characters just ultimately muddies the story, slows the plot down to a grinding halt, and it just doesn't work very well. It kind of reminds me a bit of, you know, The Wheel of Time, when you have, you know, book after book after book with so many characters in it that, you know, I think there's one book that basically it's 800 pages and about a week passes or something ridiculous <laughs> because there's just too much going on. You know, one of Rice's biggest vices as a writer is not listening to editors to the point where I don't think she even had an editor when it came to her later books. And it's a real shame because there are interesting ideas in her books, especially her later books, 
but it's often marred by going off on tangents, having these characters who don't add anything to the story. And maybe if she actually did listen to someone who read her work and said, hey, maybe you should think about this, maybe you should cut that character, maybe you should combine them or whatever, uh, maybe she would actually tell a more unified story with a more engaging plot. Part five, rewriting history. Something else that's quite common in very long fantasy series, especially a series like The Vampire Chronicles, which is not a planned series. You know, Interview the Vampire was a standalone book. Rice then decided to tell more stories within this world. But, you know, essentially, it's not like she's been planning this entire big series for, you know, since she was 20 or something. It's she's coming up with a new idea and then telling a book within this world. And this is fine, but it does mean that you end up with this tendency to sort of make everything seem like it was, you know, planned and connected all along. And the problem with doing things like that is that ultimately, and most of the time, it can be very, very contrived. Now, it's not like this always fails. You know, sometimes it can work. I recently read The Pickwick Papers by Dickens. That was a very long book, which Dickens didn't necessarily have a plan for. He was just going with episodes uh, and inspired by these drawings. And so you do get a sort of very whimsical plot where things are just not very consistent and all over the place. But because Dickens' world is a very whimsical, you know, picaresque world, it makes sense. Whereas with Rice, it's not really that kind of writing. It's sort of serious and it's meant to be all connected. And that's the implication. But unfortunately, Rice just doesn't pull this off. And the changes that she makes just don't convince. Probably the most egregious and annoying thing that I find here is this attempt that she has to rewrite Akasha's motivations from the Queen of the Damned. Basically implying that Queen Akasha did not have this, you know, desire to destroy all men, but rather she was just listening to this voice that was telling her to do everything all along. It kind of undermines the whole purpose of that book and a lot of the stakes from that book if it's not really Akasha doing it, she's just listening to a voice. There's also no real reason to do this to the story. You know, you could just have a story where this, you know, demon awakens and starts doing what he does in the story. There's no reason to necessarily tie it back to Akasha, uh, aside from just wanting to make everything seem like it was connected and planned all along when everyone who's reading it knows that it wasn't. Another thing that is starting to bug me with the Vampire Chronicles is Rice's tendency to re-explain things in terms of science. You know, ultimately the original trilogy, it's a supernatural novel with heavy Christian imagery and lore, and while Rice does do some interesting things within that, ultimately that's what the story, that's the kind of law that we're going for. But then as we move on in Rice's career, she sort of wants to move away from that sort of supernatural stuff, and she wants to bring science in. You know, this started in the Mayfair Witches, when she started getting into this stuff, you know, witches are like mutants or whatever, uh, and she continues that sort of trend here. And the problem is, she's just not a very good science fiction writer. She does really well with vampire lore. And in fact, what I really like about the early Vampire Chronicles is the way that they do interesting things with that classical lore. You know, she plays around with it. She explores the whether immortality is such a great thing, all that stuff. But when it comes to trying to bring the science in, I just don't think it convinces at all. And it just seems like she just wants to sort of, you know, have a gotcha moment where it's like, ha, ah, you thought that this was unexplainable. Well, actually, it can all be explained uh, with very, very bad basic science. You know, part of what makes vampires and this kind of gothic horror so interesting is the, you know, the, the mystical nature of it. So this attempt to demystify everything, I just don't think is very good off the face of it. And I also don't think it's very good when you're not very good at putting these things in scientific terms. Part six, the start is too perfect. The final problem with this book, and I'm afraid to say it, is the start himself. Yes, his characterization is more consistent than it was in Blood Canticle, you know, where he could go from being this high Parisian romantic to, a, you know, a redneck within the space of the same paragraph. But his characterization is still off and he is just becoming so perfect. And you can tell that Rice is just so in love with this character that she's unwilling to give him any flaws and make him interesting in any way. You know, one of the great things about the start as a character in his early books is that Yes, he's sort of charming and charismatic, but he's also not a very good or nice person. He thinks he's great, he thinks he's wonderful, but he's actually not, and he's done terrible things, whether that's to Louis, to Claudia, or to, you know, even David Talbot, who didn't want to become a vampire, but the start decided that he would make him into one. All of these things make his character, you know, interesting, because you've got this dichotomy, someone who's amazing and intriguing, but at the same time, you know, morally sort of dubious. And also he had very interesting relationships with his uh, vampire companions. All of them pretty much had these very deep, interesting relationships. But at this point, pretty much everyone loves Lestat as well. It's not just Rice, the author, but all of the characters. 
You know, they don't really seem to have any of the tension in their relationships anymore. They're all just like bowing down to him all the time, like you're so wonderful, you're so amazing. And I just don't buy it because Lestat's character, he's meant to be impulsive and he's meant to be you know, sort of looked down upon by characters like Marius. Like, yes, they respect him and value him, but they also recognize that he's reckless and stupid. You know, he's not a very old vampire. He's not ancient like them. And so for them to sort of just bow down to him all the time, it just I just don't buy it and it's just not very consistent with the past characterization of these characters. Ultimately, I just think that the start has become so perfect a character that he's just become very uninteresting to actually read about. All of the stakes are gone, all of those complicated relationships are gone, everyone just looks up to this amazing, perfect character. And again, it's a real shame because with the start, Rice did create a very compelling character, at least to begin with. Part 7. Conclusion. So ultimately, I just didn't really find much to enjoy in Prince Lestat. I will give Rice some credit in that this book is a massive improvement over Blood Canticle, but then Blood Canticle might be one of the worst books I've ever read, so I don't know how much praise that really is. I do appreciate the attempt to bring back some old faces, the attempt to tell a sort of new story that aims at connecting things uh, and moves the world forward. I do appreciate all of that, but I just think that ultimately it was bogged down with some big problems. I think that the characters who we care the most about and who are the most interesting were massively underused. I think that the new characters, while well, again, there's nothing wrong with bringing new characters in, but they just didn't add anything to the story and they were basically indistinguishable. And I think while the plot or the premise of the plot was quite interesting, it just didn't really go anywhere and it was ultimately just trapped with these different characters who were just slowing the pace of the story down constantly. I am going to carry on reading The Vampire Chronicles. I'm so close to the end, I've got to, and I am sort of curious to see where Rice does take this. I know that the next book is meant to be even more sciencey and weird, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. Uh, but yeah, ultimately I just didn't find this to be the return to form that some of you seem to, seem to think it was. So I'm sorry to disappoint uh, if you were thinking that I would enjoy this one. I really didn't. All right, so that's it for this video. Let me know what you think of this book. Do you think it is a return to form? And I would like to know why you think this, um, because for me, clearly, you know, that's not the case. But I'm interested to know why you think it is such a good return to form, if you think that. It might be a while before I get to the next book, because getting through this one was a bit of a slog, but I will try and get through it somewhat soonish, just because it's also quite fun sometimes to do these negative reviews that I, I tend not to do, because generally I like to be positive, but I am committed to this series and I do want to finish it. So if the rest of the reviews are negative, then so be it. Take care, everyone. Ta-ra.